All right, well, let's go ahead and get started then. For those of you who um, have never joined in on a Center for Election Science event, welcome. Uh, my name is Caitlin Pena. I'm the Director of Operations and Programs here at the Center for Election Science. If you don't know us, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit and we are focused on empowering voters uh, with better voting methods to strengthen democracy. And the main voting method that we advocate for is called approval voting. We're not gonna be talking about that today, but just to give you just a, a 30 second rundown, approval voting is a voting method that allows you to vote for all the candidates you like. Votes are tallied up and the candidate with the most votes wins. We just helped uh, St. Louis become the second city in the US to use approval voting this past uh, November. So that was a big exciting win for us this year. Um, and then we host lots of events like this where we talk about election and politics related issues. So we're really excited to have Dr. Christian Gross on with us today and so happy that all of you could be here. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. Gross. He is an associate professor of political science and public policy at the University of Southern California. He is the academic director of the USC Schwarzenegger Institute for State and Global Policy. He also directs USC's Fair Maps and Political Reform Lab, where researchers, students, and policy practitioners work together to generate new ideas to transform American democracy. Christian is also an expert in political reforms and voting rights, including top two primaries and the Independent Redistricting Commission. Of course, those are two topics that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on his research, which often uses field and survey experimental techniques to answer questions about public policy, political institutions, and elite behavior. Christian is the author of more than 30 articles and chapters about American politics, public policy, legislative politics, executive politics, race, race and ethnicity, and political representation. And his book, Congress in Black and White, won the Best Book on Race and Politics Award from the American Political Science Association. So we are very happy to have Christian here with us. Um, and we also have, of course, our executive director of the Center for Election Science, Aaron Hamlin. He's also a, the co-founder of our organization. Um, and so I am going to go ahead and hand it off to Aaron, but just as a quick overview, Aaron uh, and Christian will be talking for probably about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll use the last 15 to 20 minutes for audience Q&A. Of course, if you have any specific questions throughout, feel free to stick them in the chat. If it makes sense, we might answer them in the middle of the discussion, but otherwise, um, I will go ahead and moderate the chat at the end of the event and uh, have Christian answer your questions. So with all of that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Aaron. Awesome. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, and I'll go ahead and, uh, we're, so we're looking at two pieces of work that uh, Christian worked on, one with the gerrymandering and the other looking at partisanship, uh, comparing different types of primaries. And so. Uh, maybe Christian, if it's uh, okay with you, if we start with the uh, uh, gerrymandering uh, paper. Yeah, sure. That sounds great. And thanks for having me. Awesome. It's absolute pleasure uh, uh, talking with you. Uh, so I just put the, the link in there. Uh, and I find that with uh, a lot of these types of uh, projects, uh, sometimes like there's like a, a backstory or, or interesting component of how you met some of the collaborators. Is uh, anything going on with that here when you're looking at uh, the uh, uh, the political makeup of, of states and how that differs with how people voted. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, just for a little bit of background, which will help answer that question, like who are the collaborators on this particular project about gerrymandering? Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm the academic director of the Schwarzenegger Institute at USC. I'm also a professor. Um, one of the things that we do at the Schwarzenegger Institute that Governor Schwarzenegger is really interested in that pro provides some of that backstory about this project is when he was governor of California, he was um, a huge proponent of the Independent Redistricting Commission and he pushed for it via ballot initiative, um, took a couple times to get it passed, uh, but it was passed and went into implementation for the first time in 2012. And so part of this project is in the spirit of the Schwarzenegger Institute where we focus on redistricting. Um, so that's a little bit of the backstory, but the other backstory is that, um, you know, I'm and one part of my job is I'm the academic director of the USC Schwarzenegger Institute. The other part is I'm a professor. 
who does research and teaches. So the other three students, are, uh, the other three authors on this project about gerrymandering and minority rule in the United States are uh, two, uh, two former graduate students, one of whom is now a professor at Pomona College and another one who's a professor at NC State and a current graduate student. And so we got together because they also are part of the political reform lab that um, we study redistricting, gerrymandering primaries and other election reforms. Um, there's a little bit more backstory about one of the authors. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, Sarah Sadwani was a graduate student of mine at USC. We wrote about gerrymandering and then in the interim, she became a professor and she applied to be on the California Redistricting Commission. She made it through the initial process and her number was randomly drawn to be selected and she is now a redistricting commissioner on the California Redistricting Commission. So one of the authors of the study I'm talking about is actually currently on the California Redistricting Commission. Well, that's, that's awesome. And uh, it sounds like you've really uh, provided some excellent opportunities for your uh, uh, for your students too, so I'm, I'm sure they're uh, they're very thankful for you. Yeah, I'm, we I try to I try to collaborate with students definitely. Cool. Uh, so so here with this uh, article, uh, and I, I I find that this uh, isn't at least quantified uh, as as explicitly as you do here. Um, but before we go further, uh, what we're really talking about here are false majorities. Um, so maybe if you if you can maybe just kind of go over that concept for folks. Yeah, sure. The, I mean, the idea of false majorities or what we call minority rule in this study is the idea that under redistricting plans, and just to make sure everyone's on the same page, most of you probably know what it is already. But redistricting is the process of redrawing lines that happens every ten years after the census. And so the house districts in every state will be redrawn if there's more than one house member and state legislative districts will be redrawn in every single state. That process is happening starting now for the 2022 elections. Um, but we looked at the last cycle of redistricting and wanted to see where are states that have state legislatures that are one party, but the voters are nevertheless choosing another party. So for example, um, one of the best known ones is Wisconsin. Wisconsin for the redistricting in 2012, the state legislature drew a map that was extremely gerrymandering. It was a partisan gerrymander. Um, it favored the Republicans. Um, when we did our study and we were looking at 2018 data, um, the, the Democrats got a majority of the vote in Wisconsin, but got much larger proportion, or got much fewer proportion of the seats. Similarly in North Carolina at the time, uh, Virginia at the time, had one party who got a majority of the votes, but nevertheless got less than 50% of the seats in the legislature. So we think these are like the extreme examples of partisan gerrymandering. We wanted to identify the, the worst partisan gerrymanders in, in, the, um, in the country at the state legislative level. And the idea is that it's a false majority in the sense that there's a majority party in one legislative chamber but the voters chose a different party. Um, if you look at the aggregate statewide vote across the entire state. And that seems to be the most egregious problem when it comes to gerrymandering, the idea that you would have a, a majority of voters who favor one particular thing, but a majority of the legislature is actually coming from another party. And, and here like you, there are um, a number of states that, which fit this threshold of where um, uh, the party itself gets the majority of seats and yet the majority of voters go the opposite way. Um, maybe you want to uh, point out some guilty states for us. Yeah, and I will preface this. When we wrote this, we, we did this following the 2018 elections, right? We just had an election in 2020. So it'd be really nice to update this and to add in the new data. And there have been some interesting changes in a couple states legally and also ballot initiative wise that I'm happy to talk about. But after the, after the last election, not the one a month ago, but the one two years ago, there were five states that were the real problem states. In the, in the state houses in those in those states. So we looked at states that the legislature drew their own lines, right? So not states like California with an independent commission, but states where the legislators redrew the map. And then how big of a gap was there between the majority vote from voters and the majority of legislators in terms of who controls the chamber. And so the worst, the worst states were Virginia, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and North Carolina. Just for example, Virginia at the time, 44.5% of the state's voters 
chose the Republican Party, but 51% of the seats in the state house were controlled by the Republicans. That has subsequently changed in the, um, in the, in the, the last election in 2019. Um, and also Virginia, really interestingly, even because it was one of these minority rule states, um, the, both the legislature and the voters decided to move towards a commission. And so they're going to be using a commission in the next, in the next cycle. Um, but Wisconsin, as I mentioned earlier, just to give you the numbers, is considered one of the worst. Um, and actually, let me just, I have, these, I have these on a slide. Let me share the slide. Is that okay, Aaron? Um, instead Free of just, go right ahead. Yeah. Instead of just uh, barreling through a lot of data, why don't I show you the actual numbers that I'm talking about? Um, so uh, um, here, this is state houses, so state legislatures, lower houses. I mentioned Virginia. Uh, this is uh, circa 2018, right? But Wisconsin, 44.7% of the state's voters voted for the party that got 64.6% of the seats, right? And so the Republicans control almost two thirds of the seats in the Wisconsin State House, but received a little bit less than 45% of the vote in 2018. Um, Pennsylvania, we see a similar story. Michigan, a similar story. North Carolina, a similar story. Michigan, as many of you may know, the voters chose to put um, uh, a redistricting commission on the ballot and has been implemented and those commissioners have been selected and will be redrawing the lines in that state as well. Um, so some of these worst offenders uh, in our study that we, we did uh, about a year ago um, are actually making some significant changes, Virginia and Michigan, um, in terms of how they're gonna be redrawing the lines. Um, it, interesting here, and, and this is something that I see is kind of being pointed to a little bit in, in the chat. Um, I recall there being some research where there is a, uh, uh, an innovative mathematician who said, okay, well, uh, when, we're, when we have these single member districts, which in, in the US with uh, uh, not, now that Illinois stopped using cumulative voting, everybody uses single member districts for their, uh, uh, for their state chambers. And so one interesting component of this is that you can have some uh, of these false majorities where, or, or some disproportionality where one party, and here in the US we're just really talking about two parties with the way that, we, uh, that our system is set up, uh, but we can have one party um, get a greater percentage of the vote um, where it's just because of the way the geography lies and that by, and some of this other research looking at this and saying, okay, well, even if we just kind of randomly drew these lines, like what proportion of the time would we come up with this result? So it was like with this kind of false majority, is this something that is a real anomaly or is this something that just by the mere fact of the way that people are situated uh, in, in terms of where they live, that it's just a product of, of, of that. So, uh, so how, how much do you see this as being um, uh, something that is a consequence of heavy uh, manipulative draw, uh, line drawing uh, versus somewhere else on that continuum where we're just to some extent dealing with chance here? Yeah, there, I mean, there's a robust debate in the literature among academics over how much of this is intentional partisan gerrymandering and how much of this is what you described, certain people living in certain parts of the state who favor Republicans or Democrats. Um, I mean, where I come down is that, in, especially in these cases of the worst gerrymanders, um, which I should pronounce gerrymander, I'm seeing Joseph in the chat is, is saying the correct pronunciation is gerrymander, and that is right, but I don't always call it that out of habit. I call it gerrymandering. Um, but uh, going back to the point, I, I think that in these really extreme cases, um, including Wisconsin, it's not about Democrats being in cities and Republicans being in rural areas. This is, um, this is pretty intentional. Um, choices to draw districts in certain ways to protect the incumbent party. Um, the, the, there's, um, if you even just look at compactness of the districts, uh, the, the, the sort of how, how much are they similar to a circle um, or a square, uh, they're, they're, they're not. They're, they, these are extreme, pretty extreme cases where the, the legislature has, has chosen to uh, maximize the seats for their for their parties, and this is something we've seen for a long time, right? So this is um, this is something that I'm we we're studying in the the last redistricting cycle from the last decade, but if you go back to the 2000s and the 1990s and and so on, um, this has happened uh, where partisan gerrymandering has been pretty extreme. 
Um, but I, I would say that this isn't just a coincidence due to geography. This is this is intentional due to the parties trying to maximize their seats. You mentioned um, independent commissions as well as as well as like um, like that that particular reform seen often as a as a solution to this. Um, what do you think with like for instance, uh, Canada has used independent commissions uh, for its uh, line drawing uh, since 1964, and we've seen in two recent Canadian elections the same kind of false majority occur at the at the national level. Uh, and so, uh, do you see that as like perhaps like uh, and not, not asking you to be an expert on on uh, uh, Canadian uh, That's what I politics? Was about to say, Aaron. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like as, as someone who's not an expert on Canadian politics, but. <laughs> Uh, but, but before before the call, you established that you were from North Carolina, which uh, is it's clearly uh, south of, uh, uh, of the of the border into into Canada, um, and, and so I I guess like uh, asking um, how much of a solution do you see these independent uh, commissions being in pushing this proportionality, um, and so like. Uh, like compared to like other solutions, e even perhaps ones that may not be as viable. Obviously, like the the purest solution would be like a proportional representation, but would require a lot of a lot of work to be able to allow that to happen. So I guess like how much of a solution do you see in the independent commissions uh, being in terms of reducing these false majorities when we see in other places when this independent commission solution is used, it doesn't always seem to, to, to pan out. So how, how, much, how, how useful do you see this being in terms of mitigating those effects? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is, so I will pun on the Canadian part of the question. It's, it's funny, I have a co-author that, that I write about redistricting with who is Canadian and also studies American redistricting. He'd be perfect for that question, but I'm, I'm not an ideal person on Canada. Um, but in the United States, like what's the difference between independent redistricting commissions and legislative drawn maps? versus say something like proportional representation. Obviously, if you want proportionality between parties' votes among voters and seats in the legislature, proportional representation will be the, the, the one that will give you the closest to proportionality, right? Because that's drawn into the electoral system. Um, you know, that's not something that is done in the United States, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be in the future, right? Um, the, um, but in terms of independent commissions to draw single member districts, which is what we have in California and several other states versus legislative drawn maps. Um, in our study, we, you know, we looked at some of that. Um, if you're interested, we have an appendix in the, in the study that Aaron linked to. We have every single percent of vote in each state and the percentage of seats in each state. And so back in 2018, um, oh, so what we found anecdotally and what I'm doing in a separate project that I, I haven't published yet is that commissions tend to be more responsive to swings in the electorate. So 2018 was a bit of a democratic year across the country. And then in, the, in a state like California, a few of the seats were quite competitive and moved to the Democrats. This year, 2020, it was a bit of a, of a split and a couple of those seats went right back to Republicans, right? And were, and were quite competitive. So when the legislators don't, don't draw the lines, it doesn't mean that you won't get shifts in, um, in partisan proportionality across elections, but it does mean you're more likely to have a go back and forth, right? So if you look at a legislative drawn map in 2012, almost the exact same proportion of seats for each party stick the entire decade. You look at commissions, it kind of bounces around because there's some competition that's naturally that's naturally drawn in. Um, and so I think I think the commission advantage versus a legislative drawn plan is the potential for a bit more sort of electoral volatility. Right. There's a potential for competition. Um, and then that has spilled spillover effects to voters, too. Right. If you care about um, constituency service, I've written about this in my book. Um, if your district is competitive in a single member district um, system, you're much more likely to reach out to voters to try to help them with things that are unrelated to public policy. So if, you, if somebody just needs help with constituency service, being in an uncompetitive district is not a good plan for getting help. Being in a competitive district is a, is a good way to potentially um, be competitive. Um, the, other, the other thing I'll mention about independent commissions, this, this research is not published yet, but I'm working with one of my grad students on public attitudes towards redistricting. And I think there's a component about redistricting commissions and legitimacy 
right? So putting the PR question aside, um, proportional representation, but just thinking about commissions versus legislators drawing the line. We did an experiment where we just asked voters, what do you think about how the commission is drawn? We gave them facts about how the California commission is done. And then we gave some other people facts about how legislators draw lines. And then we asked them, how fair do you think this process is? Not about the outcomes of which party gets which seat, but what we found is you give them the fact, you explain legislators draw lines, voters rate it as less legitimate, they rate it as less fair. You tell them a commission draws the lines and they're randomly chosen who gets on the commission, which is what's done in Michigan. And there's a component of that in California. Voters actually rate that as more legitimate and more fair. So even regardless of the outcomes, there's a little bit of fairness um, evaluation from, from citizens on the commission side. One of the things in, in the article it focuses uh, a lot on the false majority aspect, but in, in some cases, like there's this concept, uh, obviously the, the concept of, of filibuster, uh, where a, a party that um, uh, if, even if they have a majority, if they don't have over 60% to over, over uh, roll a, a filibuster, they can still have a lot of a lot of sway. Um, and so even in cases where it doesn't cause a false majority, say uh, a particular party already has more than 50% of the vote, uh, but do you see that also particularly being the case where they use uh, their power to be able to draw the lines and be able to give, gain even more power to be able to go past that 60% threshold to be able to keep a filibuster from happening? Yeah, I mean, the, there's, there are other things besides the redistricting and the gerrymandering process that can make a difference for enhancing the power of a particular party or a particular coalition in the legislature, be that at the national level or, or um, at the state legislative level. Um, I do think that even with um, you know, uh, filibusters in states that have filibusters or similar ways for minority parties to try to block, uh, minority parties in the legislature to try to block things, um, that's harder, that, that, that's, uh, that's something that is, um, um, something that is definitely gonna be used by legislators, right? Any rule that exists to help a particular block of legislators in a legislature will be used and will be used to, to their advantage. Um, in terms of the filibuster, when I think about filibuster and, and you're asking about that, um, and I think it makes me think of the US Senate immediately. And so this concept of false majorities or minority rule in our paper we focused on the state legislative lines, right? But I think if you think broadly about it, the U.S. is governed by a really, by, by a minority in most, a numerical minority of voters across most national institutions and some state institutions. So in our paper, um, when we were writing 59 million people were represented by legislatures where the party that won control did not get the most votes in the state, right? That's a lot of people. Um, and then at the national level, since 2000, for president, there have been two popular vote winners who did not win the Electoral College, right? Um, that's it's another minority rule. Um, in the US Senate, where there is the filibuster, putting aside the filibuster rule for a second, because states vary in population so differently, the, mo the majority of voters do not vote for the majority of senators. And even if you only look at the say, um, 60 senators that would be needed to stop a filibuster, even then, um, depending on who they are, a majority of voters have not chosen those 60, those 60 senators. Um, so the, the entire U.S. Senate and sometimes the presidency is selected by people who are not the majority in terms of the, the vote in the country. And then at the U.S. House level, um, because of what we've already talked about with single member districts, there are some states that have really extreme gerrymanders where there's minority rule. And then there's in a lot of other ones, there's more of a match between partisan outcomes in terms of the seats and the votes. But if you, if we, the sort of macro question about the filibuster, it's, it's often considered, oh, that's a way for minorities to have more rights. But the Senate is already representing minorities by the fact that really small states have more power than big states. And the president is occasionally elected by less people than, um, <laughs> than uh, the other candidate got votes for. And then also in the US House, some of the legislat legislators are chosen by minorities as well. Um, numerical minorities. And so the, there's a lot of minority rule and false majority sort of built into the existing US national and state legislative systems. And 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 there you're um, the you're talking about the, the product of a floor effect with the way that uh, uh, US uh, Senate seats are, are allocated by state being 
it's always at least two. So even uh, those states that have a, a lower population automatically get those uh, those two, creating a, a higher disproportionality compared to even say like the U.S. House, whereas the the floor is is one and not two. Yeah, exactly. Right. So like you, there's there's a there's some really interesting work on this by Francis Lee, who's a professor of Princeton, and Bruce Oppenheimer, who's a professor of Vanderbilt. Um, they look at this and you, depending on the coalition, you can take U.S. senators and get to 60 votes really easily. And if you look at the voters who chose them, it's not nearly 50 percent. Part of that's California and New York and Texas and so on. And Florida have so many people and are represented by just in those four states, only eight people. Right. And then you, you have put in Wyoming and Idaho and so on, and they have equal numbers, but the, the voters themselves are represented um, less. And so what it means is uh, there's a partisan component, right? So right now, Democrats are getting more votes in the Senate nationally than they are senators in terms of the seats. But it's also more about policy, right? There's more things that are agricultural or rural that maybe get a focus. There's less focus on urban and suburban interests because a lot of, of in the U.S. Senate um, than if there is more population equity. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And uh, I, I saw some other points in the uh, in the chat about, uh, so with the, an independent commission, you're talking about people uh, being randomly uh, selected to be able to, to serve on these in these commissions. Um, and we also talked about uh, uh, PR, uh, but in terms of also uh, drawing these lines, uh, there's also like an, algorithmic uh, approach as well. Uh, and so like, how do you see, and uh, keeping in mind like perhaps part of the benefits of, of having an independent commission is that these folks can be aware of the communities, uh, being able to try to keep some level of cohesiveness, like even if it doesn't say draw uh, uh, a pretty geometric shape, uh, but still uh, is able to uh, uh, bring those communities together. Um, how do you see like an algorithmic approach, both I guess in terms of it, it doing the job well, um, but also um, uh, being viable as well as um, uh, being like actually um, acceptable to people? Should that be the case? Like, should it be implemented? Yeah, that, I mean that's a good that's a good question. This comes up a lot, right? Because when I mean, so much of redistricting is mapping and data. And so that immediately leads some people to thinking about algorithms and some of the studies you've already talked about, Aaron, are about, you know, randomly drawing 10,000 maps and seeing if the, the legislative drawn map is extremely different than what would have done, been done randomly. Um, so that, that is a possibility. I mean, algorithms are used in the research on redistricting. I do think it's a little, I, I'm a little concerned by it and would prefer, I prefer some human component to it because, um, well, one, somebody wrote the algorithm to begin with, right? And that person is, is at least right now, is human. Give us another decade, and then we'll have the AI writing the, the algorithms. But, um, and so there could be, you know, that there's something there. Um, but also, you know, we, we need to consider things like voting rights, communities of interest, the Voting Rights Act, um, the, which Shelby B. Holder got rid of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, but there is still the rest of the Voting Rights Act, and especially Section 2, that's important for redistricting. Um, and then in general, there's a lot of things that is are important, especially the um, commissions have tended to do, and some legislatures do too, is to go out into the community and say, you tell us what are the communities that map? Where should the lines be drawn to not cut communities and where should they be? Um, and an algorithm can't pick all of that up, that sort of public interfacing with where communities may or may not be and where specific communities of interest may be. Um, and algorithms also given, um, the, if, if we care about um, um, if we care about multiple dimensions, right? The algorithm would have to choose which dimension matters, more, right? And so it's, I mean, it's similar when a commission's drawing the map too, but um, but the, I, I think it's important to have the give and take between voters, citizens, commissioners, line drawers to hear what the communities are. Less than um, I think that's preferable to an algorithm. Uh, so I, I want to make sure we get uh, some time to the uh, uh, partisanship study with the top two as well. But before we transition over there, are there any other um, like fun points or, or highlights that you want to uh, bring up about the uh, gerrymandering and, and, uh, and redistricting? Yeah, I mean, the last thing on redistricting that I think is really important for everybody to look at is um, the voting rights component of redistricting. 
um, this paper is about partisan gerrymandering and the lack of of uh, and, and majority minority rule in the legislature relative to the voters. Um, but this will be our first redistricting cycle coming up right now, where states are redrawing their state legislative plans and their congressional plans. That is without Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, which I just mentioned. Section Five of the Voting Rights Act, the many of you probably know, um, you know, uh, provided protections for minority voting rights um, in certain parts of the country, mostly the South and a few other places like Arizona and Alaska. Um, and in a couple other places. That's not there anymore because the Supreme Court got rid of it. And so what does that mean? That means when states redraw their lines who used to be under Section 5, they don't have to send them up to the Justice Department anymore, right? 10 years ago, um, the, 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 you know, the state of North Carolina would have had to send their plan to the Biden, the incoming Biden administration, you know, if, if, if that was still in right now. Um, uh, the, um, at that time, it would have been the Obama administration. But, um, the, um, that's not there. And so I think that's something just to keep your eyes on that the Voting Rights Act still exists for national section two coverage, but this section four, section five coverage is gone. And I think it's gonna be another sort of wild west of gerrymandering with not having to meet um, the Voting Rights Act standards of section five. Um, and transitioning to the uh, other uh, work that you've done. I'll go ahead and put that in the uh, chat here. Uh, so your other work was looking at the uh, looking at uh, ideology and partisanship and the role that primaries uh, play in affecting that, uh, in particular uh, open primaries uh, with uh, with top two. Uh, so uh, in, in a similar kind of flavor with what we did with the introduction to the uh, to the other article um, what, was there anything interesting about the way uh, this uh, uh, this article and this uh, research group started with you yeah I think for I mean for this article so this this is published in the journal of political institutions and political economy it came out earlier this year um, the backstory is not quite as interesting but probably because I just wrote it by myself um, this is a this is a topic that I'm interested in, and I've always been interested in political reform. And the political reform lab focuses on a lot of these different topics: redistricting, gerrymandering, voting rights, primaries, um, other electoral reforms. Um, and so this is this is one I've just been wanting to do, and I, I decided to write the paper. So a little bit less interesting backstory, Aaron. Yeah, so sometimes uh, you just gotta you just gotta go with it. <laughs> yeah, the, the advantage of being a tenured professor is you can write things that you think are interesting and hopefully other people will also find them interesting. Uh, uh, so I, I, so here we're talking about um, the role uh, that the primary plays in uh, affecting uh, partisanship. So uh, we've got like two variables here. We've got in our social science world, we've got our independent variable and our, and our dependent variable here, the dependent variable being uh, partisanship. Now, uh, that's, uh, so how when when you're measuring partisanship like what does it look like when you measure that and um how do you tell so one there's measuring partisanship but like how do you tell if something is um partisan in general or like are you measuring partisanship relative to the general population so like are you centering like partisanship like how does that work when you're measuring that that construct yeah that's a really good question so i'm, I'm going to just share my screen briefly for this article too and um to answer that. And so th this is the title of the paper, but just to, to how do you measure ideology, right? The, the outcome or the dependent variable that I study in this article is how um, ideological the member of Congress is. I look at all members of Congress from 2002 to the present, and I want to see, are they really ideologically extreme or are they ideologically moderate? And so in this, in this paper, I use an existing measure that's relatively common in political science called the the nominate estimate. It was developed by Keith Poole and Howard Rosenthal. It's been extended by James Lowe, one of my colleagues at USC, and Jeff Lewis at UCLA, and several other scholars. Um, and that looks at every single roll call vote in Congress that every member of Congress has taken, and it scales them left to right. Um, it, it fixes them relative to one another, and it also fixes them relative to time, right? So you can track is a member of Congress in um, uh, the New York 22nd district to the left or to the right. 
of member of Congress from the first district in Illinois, right? And so it's basically scaling every roll call vote and then putting them on a negative one to plus one scale. Um, and then in my paper, what I did is I just, I just folded that scale and made an absolute value. And I have some other ways to measure it too, but, but the easiest way is zero means you're very moderate, one means you're very extreme, and then everything in the middle. So one is extremely liberal or extremely conservative and a zero is very moderate. Um, and then I just looked at primaries and um, how people elected in open primaries and top two primaries, are they more moderate or more extreme than closed primary legislators? And I found that closed primaries elect more extremists and open primaries elect more, um, elect more uh, moderates. Now, going into uh, the, the scale that you're describing, so it sounds like your um, uh, extremism is measured relative to other people who are elected. Um, do you, uh, what do you, what do you think about that relative to like, so for in like the paper we, we just discussed, like we, we were talking about how the people who are, are elected don't necessarily represent the uh, the people who elect them. Um, and so uh, do, you, do you think that would play out like relative to like the, uh, the voters themselves? So, so that is, do you think these people are uh, on that same part of the scale uh, relative to voters as they are to the other people in Congress? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's, it's hard to answer with this particular data set just because there aren't really, there aren't voters as part of it. It's all just legislators relative to other legislators. So when I say someone is extreme, they're only as extreme as everybody else in Congress, right? There's, there are almost certainly voters in the United States that are to the left and to the right of the most extreme members of Congress. There's also a lot of voters in the country that are probably much more moderate than the, the sort of average Democrat and the average Republican in, in the House. And so I don't really measure that as much, but then that's, that's kind of like the fundamental measurement problem in political science that people like me and people who are probably smarter than me have been trying to figure out. A few people have made advances. If you could measure voters and elected officials ideologically on the same scale. Um, the one problem with voters is they're not always that ideological, right? They, they care about a lot of different things some issues, some not issues. So it's a little bit hard to put them on the scale, but elected officials, it's really easy to do because they take hundreds of votes every year. And so we know Maxine Waters from Los Angeles is more liberal than Dan Lipinski, former, former Democratic legislator from Illinois, right? Like that's just because they vote differently and we can observe that they vote differently. And so with voters, it's a little bit harder, but I do think that, um, the scale, the scale of negative one to one or zero to one, it's just an arbitrary number to try to capture congressional extremity. But there certainly could be people in the country that are that are more liberal than Maxine Waters and more conservative than Louis Gohmert in Texas, for example, right? I mean, the um, or or don't even what I haven't talked about don't even fit on the left right scale, right? So so we're 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 um, we're measuring the left left right scale in these measures and in my paper I measured the left right scale it's also possible to have additional scales um, the single member district system used in Congress encourages uh, one dimensional voting most of the time meaning a, a traditional left right scale right some of the electoral reforms that you've been talking about and that your center is interested in approval voting um, proportional representation that we discussed earlier those would generally encourage multi dimensional issues beyond the left right scale right and so part of it we're measuring I'm, I'm measuring left right scale in this paper but it's also embedded in the in the electoral system of the united states and when you say another dimension uh, you're referring to things like uh seeing like a nolan chart where you get to see like uh multiple like looking at like economic liberalism versus conservatism and like social uh conservatism versus social liberalism yeah, exactly. Social issues versus economic issues or thinking about it right now, a good example is um, like um, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez actually shows up where she votes sometimes against the Democratic Party and she's voting on some other dimension besides traditional left right, um, or, or at least she is compared to everybody else in Congress, right, when she's when she's one of the only people who's voting no. Um, and so there's some other thing that's going on and explaining it, right, in like the 1950s and 60s. There was a traditional economic dimension or economic issue um, in Congress, and then there was another one that was mostly about race and civil rights.
Um, so there's some other issue besides sort of traditional economic left-right conservatism. And in this paper, I'm measuring that traditional left-right connection. Uh, and so go, going back to the, the variables that we're, that we're dealing with, we, we just were speaking about the, how we measure, uh, how, how you're measuring partisanship uh, among these elected officials. Uh, but you, you're, you're trying to predict what that is or, or, or see if there are any differences between uh, these, the levels of this independent variable, which is the types of primaries. So maybe you can go a little bit more into the types of primaries that you were looking at. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and this is of interest. I mean, for those of you who worked on the St. Louis campaign uh, with the, the um, there, I mean, there was a form of open primaries with approval vote, right? And so, so some of you may know this very well, but let me define it for everybody. Um, so I, I really look at three different types of primaries and I define them pretty specifically as closed primaries, open primaries, and top two primaries. Closed primaries are legislative primaries where only people who are registered with the party can vote in the primary. So if you're a Democrat, you can only vote in the primary if you're a Democrat, period. Not independents, you can't cross over if you're a Republican, vote in the Democratic primary. Um, open primaries I define as any primary where you can cross over and have independents participate. Um, we're also in some states, Republicans could vote in a Democratic primary, Democrats could vote in a Republican primary. I define it pretty broadly. So I include states that, um, and this here I borrow from uh, Andy Sinclair, who's a professor at Claremont McKenna, who's written a lot about this. Um, I use his measure. Um, I define open primaries broadly as states that make it easy to vote in any primary you choose. So you might be registered a Democrat one year, but then you show up on election day and if the state has same day registration, you can change your party on the spot while you're voting in the ballot, uh, in, the, in the voting booth. And so that I count as an open primary, in addition to ones where you can just kind of go back and forth um, wherever you want. And then the, the last one I look at is the top two primary, which is used in California and Washington, and then a variant of that is used in Louisiana. And that's where there's no separate primary. There's no Republican and Democratic primary or some other party primary. Everybody runs in round one. And then in round two, two people advance. And then in round two, it's the general election. And that could be two Democrats against each other. Could be two uh, Republicans against each other. Could be a Democrat versus a Green Party candidate. Um, whoever gets the most votes in round one advances to round two. And in that case, everybody gets to vote in both rounds. And I think critically, um, there's a lot of seats where there's no partisan queue on the ballot. And that's what, that's what I argue in the paper, that top two primaries, um, yield real, more uh, moderate legislators compared to closed primaries, in part due to the fact that Democrats can run against Democrats and Republicans can run against Republicans. So if you're, um, if you're a Republican in California and you live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, most of the time in the general election, you're probably choosing between two Democrats or between a Democrat and a Green Party, right? That's, the, that's what the general elections look like. And so you're probably not that enthusiastic about either one of the candidates. They're probably way more liberal than you prefer, but you're going to choose the one that's a little bit less extreme. And so the, the, the impact of the same party general election is to basically have the removal of the partisan queue for voters. You don't, you don't choose by party, and then you've got to choose on some other criteria. That might be ideology. That might also be, um, that might also be, you know, confidence, um, charisma, factors that are sort of unrelated to partisanship. But that's the argument that when you're, when you, when everyone has a chance to vote, legislators have to be concerned about not getting their votes. So they're going to just moderate a little bit. They're not, they're not, by the way, open and top two primaries are not electing moderate moderates and then closed primaries are electing extremists. What my paper finds is closed primaries are electing extremists and open and top two primaries are electing just a little less People, right, so party is still really important in Congress and in how people act. But um, because people will be like, "Are you telling me that that you know California Democrats are moderate?" And that's that's not the point of the paper. The point is that they're actually more moderate than they would be if it was a closed primary system, right? And that's the that's the big takeaway. And I, I guess like with the uh, um, closed system, it, I, per, perhaps it shouldn't be too surprising within a closed system that the results would be more partisan because, um, it, I mean, after all, you're, you're dealing with a subset of the population, which by the mere way that they identify themselves is partisan. So I suppose it shouldn't be too surprising that uh, 
uh, the person that they pick is someone that's more partisan. Yeah, uh, there's, I mean, there's definitely part of that. And in the, I don't look in my paper at how party line the members of Congress are. I just look at their sort of overall ideological voting mm -hmm. records. Um, and it's in the, the, what's interesting about open and top two primaries is voters themselves can be, can be partisan or not. When they go cast a ballot, they can use all sorts of criteria along partisanship. But the big difference is, is especially in the top two system in the general election, there's, there's a, there's a possibility, a frequent possibility actually of um, same party general elections. And so just to, just to show you this, let me, um, let me give an example, help motivate this a little bit. Um, in about, uh, so it, this is just in California, but under the top two primary system since 2012, about one quarter of the legislative districts in the state at least once have had a same party general election, right? And so that means that even in a safe year, where an elected uh, legislator might be able to kind of vote party line and then just hope to get the majority of the same party's voters in the district, there's always a threat in the next election or the following election that their general election might be somebody of the same party. And so then the voters won't be able to just say, well, I'm gonna pick a D or I'm gonna pick an R. They'll have to evaluate them on some other criterion. Um, and just an example of what the findings are in the paper, um, I'm, comparing California to New York, um, for people who are familiar with these members of Congress, um, the effect that I find in terms of, uh, of ideological, reduction of ideological extremity is basically going from somebody like Nita Lowy, who just retired um, from New York. She's a, she was elected in the closed primary from a suburban New York City house district. She is um, pretty liberal. And then um, the, the top two primary tends to elect people who are just a little bit less liberal than her. Um, and so an example would be Julia Brownlee, who's from suburban Los Angeles, Ventura County. Um, that's the difference, about a 10 percentage point difference in moderation. And most people wouldn't call Julie Bra Julia Brownlee a moderate, right? She's, she's pretty liberal on most issues, but um, Nita Lowy is more liberal than her. And so this is the sort of get a sense of, um, are both, do both of them vote party line, like you're asking here? And both of these are pretty partisan Democrats, but, um, but Brownlee is less frequently um, voting uh, as extremely as somebody like Lowy. And this is the general effect that I'm finding in the, in the paper. So would one way to be, uh, to summarize it and correct me where, where I'm off here, uh, that uh, the open and top two systems are significantly different than the uh, closed system, but the open and top two systems between themselves are not significantly different between uh, each other. Uh, generally, so the closed system is, is very different than the open and top two in terms of the outcomes. Like, so they are more extreme among closed. The, uh, the top two is slightly, if you look at the, the point estimates of what I, what I estimated, is it leads to a little bit more moderate legislators than open primaries do, but the, the difference is much smaller, as you're, as you're indicating, between the open and the top two systems. So um, if, I don't know if you have a, a good... Um, picture to, to summarize the, the differences. Uh, so like if you had, say, like uh, uh, zero is like, uh, uh, like uh, what, what would you say is a good way to kind of reference the effect size that, that we're talking about with? So not just like them being significantly different, because like, obviously, when you have, like, in statistics, we know that when you have a large sample, um, you can get significant differences. But just because you have a bunch of power because of the sample that you have. So as, as, as if we're thinking a bit more in terms of, of uh, functionally, like how big these effect sizes are uh, in terms of the differences in partisanship that, that we're seeing based on the, um, on the type of primary. So how, how, uh, is there another way or any other way that you can kind of quantify the differences that, that this makes based on the primary in terms of like, And you, you yes, that. yes, um, I can. So, um, so one one way the 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 number I mentioned before because I think it's a little it's easier to figure out. Like the scale goes from zero to one, and so one way you could think of it is if you have a legislator in a closed primary who's at 0.8 on the scale, on average, electing somebody from a um, a top two system would would be a 0.7, right? That's that's approximately the the um, the distance. Um, and so the you know it's not um, it's actually pretty big. Um, 
in the sense of when we look at these, um, when we look at what causes legislator ideology or what's associated with legislator ideology, a, a, a effect size that big is not very common, right? Like, but on the other hand, the, being, a, being a Republican versus being a Democrat is the gap of, of uh, you know, 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 on such a scale, right? The, um, or uh, the negative one to one scale could be even bigger. So there are certain things that are much bigger than the primary system, but the electoral system is definitely having an impact here. The primary system is making a difference. And, you know, for people at the Center for Election Science who care about approval voting and really pushing the envelope on new systems, um, you know, the takeaway of this is that, you know, this is, I, I would say the open primary versus the closed primary system is a relatively small change, right? This is not a dramatic electoral system change. It's about who's allowed to vote in the first round. And then the top two case, it's a little bit more radical because of the same party in the general election being able to compete. But that moves things from, you know, 0.8 to 0.7, right? So a more, a more, a bigger electoral system change, that would be something that kind of is sort of out of the box compared to what we do at the national level, like approval voting or something. I haven't estimated this, so I'm just speculating. We'll probably be on a potentially larger scale. But the, I think the primaries, it shows that they're, they're pretty meaningful. The change is pretty meaningful in terms of electing more, um, more moderate members or less extreme members, um, even under the system in which parties are really important nationally. Um, there's all sorts of reasons that people vote extremely or moderately in Congress, but they are moving people just a little bit just a little bit to the to the middle. Um, uh, I, I think that's one of the, the fun things about empirical questions is that you can uh, hypothesize and, and measure them. So I, I hope uh, uh, we present some opportunities for you to hypothesize, hypothesize and, and measure uh, against uh, other uh, other voting methods as well. Um, are there are there any other no, Aaron on that point one thing I'm I one thing I love is the idea that so I, I think it's really cool what happened in St. Louis just even for empirical reasons. Now we're going to be able to go study this in a really large city and see what happened. And so like kudos to everyone who was able to make that happen. But now we've got a new system that we can go find out exactly how it's going to work in real life that we know about in theory um, and, and, and a lot. So yeah, I think I think a lot of the academics I think are are, are swooning a bit. Uh, uh, but uh, for for this particular article, before we move on to questions, uh, are there any other takeaways or anything else that you'd like to uh, see us uh, uh, get from this uh, uh, article that you did? Yeah, I think I think it just shows that changing electoral systems in general, like putting aside the the part about the primaries, is pretty important. And members of Congress know exactly what system they're elected in, and it's less about voters changing their behavior, and it's more about the elected officials changing their. Behavior. If elected officials are concerned that the system is going to change or the system has changed, elected officials will update and change their own behavior in office. Well, well uh, Kaylin, uh, I'll leave it to you if you want to start to uh, point out some of the, the questions for, for Christian to answer. Sure. And Christian, um, I, I want to be respectful of your time. I, there was so much good stuff to dig into with those uh, with those papers that it took us a little while to get to the Q&A. Um, how long do you have? Yeah, I, I have some time, so I can stick around as long as people want to. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, let me get to some of these questions. Um, and some of these may have been answered in the midst of the conversation. I may not have caught it. So, um, we can, we can do a quick recap if so. Um, so first we've got a question from David. He asks, how can uh, North Carolina end gerrymandering when we don't even have ballot initiatives? The, legislator, the legislative majority isn't going to act because the current situation benefits them. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, North Carolina is my home state and it's probably why I got interested in redistricting a long time ago. Um, the in, in a state like North Carolina or other states, you know, and 60% uh, of states don't have ballot initiatives. If I'm doing the math right in my head, that's an estimate. I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, but a lot of states don't have ballot initiatives. So how do you make changes when legislators have an interest in drawing maps to help them get elected and help their party? Um, there's really two strategies is one, elect new legislators. That's that's really difficult because the legislators, there's one thing that legislators definitely care about and it's their own seats, right? So that's a, it's a hard strategy. Um, it's not impossible, right? So if you look at Virginia, Virginia did pass through its legislature, a change to its constitution. It had to be passed by two different legislatures 
and also the, the voters to get changed. And Virginia is gonna be implementing a commission. Um, I think where it's most likely to occur are in states that used to be dominant one party and are moving in another direction, right? So if you look at a, if you look at a state like Virginia, the Republicans were in, dominant in the state for a long time, controlled the legislative chambers until 2018. And so the Democrats favored reform and then enough Republicans potentially were in favor of reform too, to get it passed. Then the Democrats took over the chambers um, and suddenly some Democrats when they were in charge were like, I don't know about this gerrymandering reform. And the Republicans were like, oh, maybe gerrymandering reform isn't so bad as they're seeing themselves go from a majority party to minority party. And um, uh, it was passed then with some Democrats and some, some Republicans, right? So I think a state that's gone from one party to another may be the best shot. Now, North Carolina is not that kind of state, right? So the, um, uh, and North Carolina has a history of, of partisan gerrymandering for most of the time that redistricting has existed <laughs> in US history. Um, and so I think it's harder, right? Um, and then of course, the other strategy is litigation and using the courts, right? So this, and this did happen in North Carolina at the state level, right? A case was taken to the state um, and you can sue on a number of grounds, but especially um, depending on state law, you know, of course, federal law after Rusha v. Common Cause last year, um, this said it's there's no national, there's no national um, prohibition of partisan gerrymandering. But some states, including North Carolina, could have some um, constitutional provisions that are related to that. Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I have another idea too, but that's that's um, I think that's the best bet. But I do have one other thought. It is tough for those states that, that don't have ballot initiatives. It, it leaves you with less power and less direct ways to make that change, but um, it can be done. It's just a lot more difficult. Uh, but, but your comment about uh, Virginia um, leads me into another question here. Uh, so Mary is, is from Virginia and she asks, do you think that Virginia's new redistricting commission being a hybrid of half legislators and half citizen commissioners will likely do as well as truly independent redistricting commissions that are dominated by citizen members. Some of us in Virginia are concerned that we'll have more of the same rather than true reform. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And there is a lot, we haven't talked about it, but there's a ton of variation in how commissions are done, right? They go from uh, everything from like the California model and the Michigan model, truly independent, random draws for who gets on, interviews in the case of California from the Bureau of Audits, where they're interviewed by a Republican, a Democrat, and an independent, um, all the way to there's certain commissions that are called politician commissions that are really basically like the legislators choose, or in some cases appoint themselves to be on the commission. Um, and so I think we have less, we just have less empirical knowledge about these sort of hybrid commissions that will have some citizens and some legislators. It's very possible the legislators will kind of have a lot of, um, a lot of influence because they're a little bit more knowledgeable and friendly. I do think it depends on who the citizens are that are chosen. I think that matters a lot, right? So, I mean, one thing I like about the California independent model is that the commissioners go through, um, before there's a random draw for the final choices, there's a, an extensive process considering, you know, competence, qualities, ability to work with people of other parties, um, diversity, voting rights knowledge, a lot of different criteria where you get good people in the final pool and then there's a random draw. And then after the random draw in California, they pick six more people um, based on like all of those criteria again. And so I do think the type of citizens chosen help. Um, and you know, I think it just remains to be seen what will happen in Virginia. Yeah, we'll, have to, we'll have to watch them closely and see how it goes. Um, all right, question from Nassim, who I know how to hop out, but he's got an interesting question. How do you measure and compare districting methods, and what would you measure to compare them to a pure multi-member proportional district? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the I, I would approach that several ways, right? So there's just, when you're comparing redistricting methods and then electoral systems in general, just what are the criteria that you want? And, and the one big takeaway is, Theoretically and empirically, you can never have all the things that you would want in good governance and outcomes and, and um, in electoral systems. Just every electoral system cannot deliver every single dimension of important criteria. Um, so, but having said that, right, if you if you value um, 
partisan match, right? So what we've been talking about, minority rule or not, right? It's That's a pretty straightforward measure of the percentage of the seats and the percentage of the votes and then the responsiveness along the line of what percentage of voters choose the Democrats and the Republicans or some other party and what are the seats that go to that party. Um, there's other things like responsiveness. So I didn't talk about this, but I've measured this in a lot of my research. How do legislators and other elected officials reach out to voters? So putting aside ideology, putting aside party, what do they do in office? Do they help their, their citizens? Do they respond to their constituents? Or do they ignore them, right? Are they are they so safe that they don't have to bother with serving constituents? So that's another another metric. Um, other metrics that are really important, I think, are, are voting rights and fairness and communities of interest. Um, and I think that's something that we've done a lot of with redistricting, but we've done less when looking at multi-member districting and other, or excuse me, multi-member systems and other electoral systems. Um, and then I think in political science, there's people like me who study the United States. And we're really comfortable with single member districts and we love to study alternative electoral systems too, but they don't exist as much in the US until recently with the proliferation of a lot of real innovations at the local level and to a lesser extent at the state level. Um, and then there's lots of people who study other countries where we have extensive diversity in electoral systems. And so I think, um, I think the, uh, to really understand the difference between like a US redistricting single member district system and other systems, would be to, to consult some of that, that literature outside of the US. Um, and there, you know, just to summarize some, it's a, it's a voluminous literature and, and I am an expert on the United States. So I, I am not as, um, I haven't done this work myself. So I'm citing some other people's work. Um, but in general, the more proportional representation um, that's found, there's some work by Bing Powell, for instance, who studies, studies uh, a bunch of different countries. The more PR oriented the national electoral systems are, the more likely public policy comes out at about where the typical or median voter is. Under single member district systems, the district itself might choose somebody who's, who's um, consistent with what the voters want, but in the legislature as a whole, the outcomes don't end up being that, that um, consistent with what the, the sort of average or median person in the entire country would prefer. Um, and I, and you know, there's some other literature too, but I think that's a really interesting one that the PR system elects extreme legislators sometimes, but on average, like the policy outcome is more in line with what the voters want. And then the single member district system can kind of move things all over the place for the reasons we've talked about today. Yeah, that's super interesting. Definitely makes sense though. Um, I, I wonder if the, it's, it seems like the uh, people who are elected fit more of what we would see as like a normal distribution versus like a bimodal distribution, uh, which we perhaps see more with the uh, uh, a single member district uh, system that uh, encourages these more of these two parties. Right, yeah, I mean, for certain, you know, the single member district system and um, uh, the uh, effectively the electoral system in the United States in almost every state um, and locality where there are partisan elections leads to two member, or excuse me, leads to two party, two parties only um, because of the electoral system. And then under proportional systems and then other systems and other electoral systems used elsewhere, it encourages multi-party, um, multi-party systems. And so that's one easy metric that we know consistently the single member district system encourages two parties and, and other systems encourage more than two parties. Um, let me see. We've got a question from Jay. He asks, isn't low barrier to ballot access uh, larded? I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I, I got a little confused by this question. Isn't low barrier to ballot access, however, larded up the ballot with minor party candidates? Okay. So, so, okay. He's asking, does low, low barrier to a ballot access, um, put too many minor party candidates and candidates with extreme views on the ballot um, and thus affect the incumbents and the majority party to an even greater advantage, especially in statewide, statewide races such as in California. Did you get that? Yeah, no, I got that. The, so I, I haven't studied the how easy it is to get on the ballot across states that much. Um, but, you know, when you've got if you've got, um, you know, thinking about the 2003 recall in California when um, Arnold Schwarzenegger got elected governor, right, that recall ballot had 100 some people on 
um, and said, did you know everybody on the ballot when that vote came up? Probably not, right? Um, there's That was a different ballot than your usual where there's only two people or maybe a few people uh, from different parties. Um, however, you know, having said that, I, I just don't know enough about the, 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 that's something worth studying more, I think, um, and probably someone has, and I just don't know about it. Um, I will say there's a lot of research in California um, and elsewhere showing that the first person listed on the ballot gets a little bit more of the vote, right? So by logic, if you've got 20 or 30 people on a ballot for one office, the, you know, the low barriers to access could potentially harm the people who are lower down the ballot. Um, and in California, the counties, um, the, there's randomization of the order of candidates. So you can look at who's first and they're randomly chosen to be first and they differ across different places. So everyone's ballot doesn't have the first person, the same first person. And you can look and see this consistent pattern of approximately one percentage point, maybe a little bit more um, based on the literature of being first on the ballot. And so I, I don't know if that research has also looked at the number of people on the ballot. It probably has, and it probably makes a difference. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some information out there somewhere we could find if we dug it up. Um, all right, we've got a question from Joseph. He, uh, he says, some evidence suggests that voter politics worked more like Rotten Tomatoes reviews. So scores in the 50% range aren't usually films that people feel lukewarm on. They're films where half the viewers love it, half hate it. So voters might not be centrist or moderate so much as they have very liberal views on some matters and conservative views on others. If that were true, would that reframe the existing research on democratic reforms? Yeah, that's a really good point. And there's 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 some research showing that voters are exactly like you described, right? They're not, there's a long literature in political science suggesting they're not that ideological. Um, and some of them can't even figure out sort of what would be a left or a right scale. Others are definitely more ideological um, and that may be increasing some over time too. Um, but um, in terms of the research on political reform, a lot of it, it looks at voters. And my takeaway is that with voters, voters are basically going to make decisions within the system they're given, right? So voters aren't, voters don't have to be sophisticated. They don't have to be ideologues for ideological outcomes to occur. The people who are sophisticated are the candidates running and the people who win, right? And so they know the system they're running in and they know that the system will encourage or discourage extremity one way or the other. The voters are making choices um, that may or may not be sophisticated. So if you think about the top two primary example, you've got a, you've got a voter who's, who's not particularly ideological, but they're very strong identified with the Democratic Party. There's a Democrat and a Republican on the ballot, they vote for the Democrat. It's a really easy choice. They don't have to think about it very hard and they're probably gonna be relatively happy with some of the choices that person makes, right? But then if you've got a general election where it's a Democrat versus a Democrat or a Republican versus a Republican, they can't use that easy decision. So they have to do something else. They don't have to become an ideologue to figure out that someone's moderate. They then have to just evaluate, well, here's these two people. I can't, can't decide on party anymore. Does this person seem more competent? Does this person seem like they're speaking to me, right? Does this person seem like they're off, they're off in left or right field, right? So there's sort of cues that are still used potentially by unsophisticated voters that can lead to less extreme candidates and um, elected officials. I'm, I'm a big proponent of, but most electoral system changes will change the elites, the candidates and the elected officials because they're paying attention to every single possibility of what could happen under a different system. The voters don't have to change that much. They just have to choose within the choices and the system that's presented to them. And so you can, it is not um, out of the question to have non-ideological voters, even voters that are busy and not particularly sophisticated, but a system change that could act, an electoral system change that will lead to different, different types of people getting elected. A really interesting comment. I, I wouldn't have thought about that because a lot of times when we are talking about voting methods, we we talk we focus on the voter and how it how it will affect them. Um, but it's it's a good point that even if the the it doesn't change the voters' behavior, it still is going to have an effect on the candidates and and the electeds. Um, and that also kind of goes into this next question and. I think you answered it a little bit earlier, um, but Susan says, Texas has open primaries and we still seem to end up with extremely partisan candidates. 
Of course, we are also pretty heavily gerrymandered. Have you looked at how ranked choice voting, and I'm gonna insert approval voting, impacts ideological extremism? Yeah, so I mean, in Texas, I do think the, the gerrymandering is a, big, is a big issue there, right? And so I think a lot of what's going on with some of the elected officials is due to gerrymandering um, in, in the state. Um, though also Texas is a state where, you know, it depends on, depends on where and what districts, right? In terms of the level of extremity. Um, have I looked at ranked choice voting or approval voting and its impact on extremity? I've not done that. I would like to do that. I'm, I'm extremely encouraged by the changes across the country in Maine, St. Louis, Alaska, elsewhere, North Dakota, um, where there's changes that will, we will have variation in the way people are elected so we can study it more. And so I, I hope to do some of that in the future. Yeah, I, I, I can tell you're getting excited about this. <laughs> like so much, so much interesting new things to study as an academic. That's that's really exciting, the experimentation there. Um, all right, are, are you still okay on time? We've got maybe about four more questions. Some are a little bit longer than others. Most I think would be answered relatively quickly. Yeah, I think I could do it in five or 10 minutes. My, my son is sitting over here. That's, that's what I think. So he, if you hear... Oh, I heard him just now. Okay. Well, yeah, but, let's but give me about five or 10 minutes and then we're good. Okay. That, that's totally fine. Um, all right. Well, then we've got another a question from a different Joseph, Joseph A. Um, he asks, how much of the increase in legislative partisanship can be reduced to issues in electoral systems and how much is relative to increased partisanship in the electorate at large? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of that's, that's a really good point. Um, you know, if we compare the last several decades, partisanship among voters has increased, um, especially among voters who are attentive and paying attention to media, very, very much. A, there's, that's definitely been part of the story. So, you know, the part I'm talking about with redistricting and gerrymandering, um, you know, I do think that institution makes a difference. Um, and so do some of these other electoral institutions as well. But you know, there are other factors separate from what I'm looking at in this in the citizenry in the electorate general. Generally, the electorate has become since the 1980s much more much more partisan and much more polarized. I mean, you can see this even in the presidential level, right? You look at 1984, Reagan wins overwhelmingly across almost every state. You just look a couple of years later, 1992, Bill Clinton wins in a lot of states, right? The and now um, in our presidential elections, the idea of any candidate winning you know, states that a, another party won by 10 or 20 points, you know, in the previous couple of cycles is just not likely. So that's a, there is increasing polarization, um, both at the elite level and among voters that I think is important um, and worth, worth trying to figure out. And I mean, in terms of the electoral systems, you know, trying to figure out what electoral system might encourage voter depolarization could be helpful too, right? But, uh, but even among voters, I still think there's, there's this sort of group of like elite voters who really pay attention and are and you know high high consumers of news that are extremely polarized. And then there's some other voters that are a little bit less um, on those dimensions, and they're they're still somewhat different. And and I do think that um, you know looking for ways to not just to encourage deep like less polarization at the elite level, but thinking about voters is important too. Absolutely. Um... All right, then we've got a couple questions from David. I'll, I'll space them out so to give everybody else some, uh, some a chance. Um, but the first question from David, he asks, what differences in resulting polarization would you expect in the top two primary using plurality versus approval voting? Which is, uh, it's kind of similar to what, what you were just talking about. Um, and you mentioned that you haven't looked into approval voting yet, but is there any insight you might you might have into the top two primary using plurality versus approval voting. And I guess he would have to mean a, an open primary that goes into the top two, right? Because you couldn't, you couldn't use approval voting for the top two because that would just be voting for both candidates. Right, yeah, I haven't thought about it a ton. I have thought about it a little bit, but um, the, it just changes the dynamics a lot. Um, and especially if you think about the candidates themselves, Right. In a top two system, it's all about making it into the top two and then winning. Right. And so um, the, those dynamics are real. The candidates are really going to think about the two stages with approval voting. The dynamics are a little bit different in terms of what the candidate strategies are. Um, 
but I haven't thought through it enough in that regard, um, in terms of the open, in terms of who's participating is if you had an approval system with like only like say you had an approval voting in, in a partisan closed primary versus an open system. Um, I mean, in general, if you have an open system, be it top two or approval by the fact, and this is what's in my paper, by the fact of having the threat of people who don't share the elected officials party voting for them or against them, makes them try to appeal a little bit to those other people, right? So having a closed primary with approval voting or having a closed primary with plurality voting, um, both of that by just restricting the electorate makes it makes the, the legislator or the candidate not have to con be concerned about losing in that round from voters who can't participate. Um, and one thing I will add is a lot of research on closed primaries are like, well, you know what, it turns out in open primaries, it's still a lot of partisans anyways that is true but again coming back to this theme of the elected officials it, it's the threat of somebody being able to vote for or against them that matters and so i do think um i do think a closed approval voting system an open approval voting system a closed um or excuse me an open top two system would all three of those would probably lead to different outcomes but i'd have to think through it a little bit more We'll, we'll have to see what what the research says once we once we have some uh, elections to test. Um, all right, just two more questions. Uh, this one is pretty quick from Paul. He asked, could a party do a closed primary before the open primary? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I suppose that'd be like a top three or no, not top three. That wouldn't be that you could have a three stage primary. But, and in some ways that is done um, in terms of party there's a top in, in the in a top two system you have everybody can vote in the first round and choose the the, the two people who move to the runoff for the second round um and so the parties themselves do endorse candidates right in, in california um when diane feinstein was up for re-election last uh, kevin de leon ran against her and um the both democrats that's who made the second round there are two democrats on the ballot and the democratic party endorsed de leon like the, the party, sort of the party elites in the Democratic Party endorsed De Leon, and then Feinstein ended up winning, but it was a very competitive election. And De Leon did a lot better than um, the people expected against an incumbent. Um, it's really close second round election. Um, and so it, it was by eight points that Feinstein defeated De Leon. Um, and uh, um, I, so I do think the party, like the, a closed system could exist in the sense of parties in, endorsing and deciding who to, who to choose both in round one and round two. Right. All right, just one more question for you and then I'll toss it back to uh, Aaron to sign us off. So one last question from David. He asks, is there a game theory aspect to this where if the Democrat controlled areas disarm by going to top two primaries and Republican dominated areas keep closed primaries, would Congress as a whole shift right? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's possible. I think that, um, so, I mean, if, yeah, if all the most democratic or most liberal constituencies in the country were elected under open top two systems, and then the most conservative and Republican areas were elected in closed systems, yeah, that would mean like on, on average that could happen. Um, you know, the difference is I think that the, the, um, the move, the, the becoming more moderate is a marginal change, right? So, I mean, what I find is, a, is that they shift. It's, it's not like California used to elect wide-eyed liberals and now they elect square, like moderates right down the middle. It's, it's that they elected really liberal people in democratic constituencies and now they're electing pretty liberal people in democratic constituencies. So I, I don't know if um, that is the logic per se. Uh, and then also, you know, Louisiana uses a similar system that um, is included in my in my estimates and so yeah I, I don't know i mean i guess if you like if that were to happen the most liberal democratic states all had open top two systems yes but i just don't see that happening i guess thanks so much for answering all those questions i know it's a lot um and i will pass it back to aaron uh, uh thank you uh caitlin for um uh, for going through these these questions and for uh, doing a lot of this organization uh, uh, and uh, having this uh, event kick off successfully. Uh, Christian, uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. It is a real pleasure uh, getting to, to nerd out with you and to, to share your wisdom with uh, all of our supporters. Uh, I see he put his uh, email there for anyone that has any questions. 
Uh, and I was also just about to plug it there for Twitter as well. Uh, so if you uh, are interested in more of the work that Christian and the Schwarzenegger Institute are doing, you can find that here. And I'll give you a direct link to Christian's uh, Twitter uh, so you can uh, follow all the uh, other cool work that he's doing. And if you would like to see uh, more events like this, as well as more places like St. Louis, uh, we would encourage you to donate. And as a little perk, if you happen to not itemize this year under the CARES Act, um, you can, if you make a cash donation to a nonprofit, it's a $300 above the line deduction, which is kind of unusual for uh, tax purposes. Otherwise, we really um, encourage you to support our work so you can see uh, more events like this and uh, be able to see approval voting and uh, in, in new cities and states. That way, uh, Christian has more opportunities to, to nerd out and uh, do more analysis. So again, thank you all for joining us and uh, thank you, especially Christian. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone. And I will say just if you're interested, the Source Center Institute in general is really concerned about these issues. So, you know, do check out our website and follow us on Twitter. I'll also put the Source Center Institute's Twitter handle on in the chat. So thanks, everybody.